<laughs> so, my name is Kimberly T. Malone, and I want to welcome you to COSI, Conversations on Social Issues. We hold this series in the library every week because we see it as an extension of our charge, we want the freedom of information, and open exchange of ideas. So, we want to learn and grow from our faculty, staff, student members, our community members, so we can all be exposed to a wide range of viewpoints. Whether or not you agree with every single thing you hear in this room, we think it's important that we're exposed to different ideas. That's how we expand our thinking and begin thinking critically. So, at the end of this, I'll give you a survey so you can give me some feedback on what went well, what you'd like to see in the future. We also have some selected resources that you can check out if you'd like some more information about this topic. I know some folks are here for class and you might, be, you might want to learn some more. So, I'm just going to jump right in. There are a few more seats over here for those of us who are joining. Can you raise your hand if there's a seat next to you? But now, I want you to join me in welcoming the presenters. I'll be introducing them and then I'll turn the floor over, right? So, we have Audi Banos, who is the co-chair of Mecha at Seattle Central College. Audi was born in Los Angeles and raised in Utah and moved to Seattle three years ago to work and learn the Pacific Northwest. She restarted Mecha at Seattle Central in 2018, winter of 2018. Yes, yeah, correct? 2017, winter. Oh, 2017. Got it. Okay. Irani Flores was first brought to the work of activism by her parents. She's now herself a community organizer. She's proud to say that she is Pure Pecha, and her people generation's resistance is what motivates her work. She currently attends Auburn Riverside High School and is a founding member of the Youth United of Auburn, which received the ACLU's Youth Activist Award in 2017 for leading the charge to develop an inclusive resolution for Auburn Public Schools and to push the school district to offer additional Know Your Rights trainings for students and families related to immigration issues. She continues to actively try to find ways to better protect the immigrant community. Claudia Flores, her immigration, her involvement in immigrant rights and social justice began in elementary school. At a young age, she realized the importance of advocating for her undocumented community. She is unapologetically undocumented and native to Mexico through her Pune Pecha ancestry. She has also been instrumental in the foundation and support of immigrant youth organizing and activism in the area of South King County and now dedicates her life in mentoring other youth in their pathway to becoming community organizers. We also have Juan Jose Bocanegra from El Comite who will be here speaking to us about the history of May Day. So, please join me in welcoming our presenters. I'm not a historian, and uh, by a long shot, but you know uh, it's the only country in the world that May Day is not celebrated. It's here in the United States, and it was here that it was created. It was in Chicago when uh, a couple of the folks were charged with murder uh, and creating a riot and a haymarket incident, and. You know, it was the beginning, there was a lot of turmoil in the 1800s, 1880s, actually, that people were starting to organize, much like, you know, kind of like what's happening today. There was a, a more understanding about what so socialism was, was like or what it should be like. Uh, more people were aspiring towards socialism. Maybe like young people today. Um, and there was a lot of uh, unrest within the labor community. People were lift, raising themselves up and trying to demand you know, better working conditions. At that time, just one condition, which was the most important, was to try and cut the hour of the day from 16 to 8. You know, a lot of people work there at all. <laughs> and um, so that, that was a very important incident. It was until like the 1880s that labor, the labor uh, was better organized to be able to uh, push this issue of an eight-hour, eight-hour day uh, working time on the owners of the of the factories and the owners of the uh, means of production in in the United States. You know, it's uh, a lot of the times. You know, people say that May Day is walking around this stupid pole and you know putting a ribbon around their neck kind of shit. But 
you know, it's always most of the struggles in this country that are celebrated are centered around worker struggles. And my first experience with May Day was in uh, Mexico City. Uh, Mexico City used to have a huge parade where all the population participated. And it was a way of demonstrating to the government that labor was very strong. Um, I also participated in the May Day labor in Cuba in 19, uh, what was that, 1976. Um, and it was, it was amazing. It was just beautiful to see all the workers, everybody participating in a march. I don't know why they call it a parade. And this went on for hours and hours, you know, people just uh, filling up the streets of Cuba. And, and at that point, basically showing their support for their government, which is a socialist government. And, you know, throughout the world in this, at, at that time when it was the Soviet Union and uh, Poland and most of the countries, May Day was celebrated. A lot of that has diminished because uh, the tendencies in, in the world affairs right now is for the right wing to be taking over a lot of these governments. And so when that happens, you know, we, like we're having here in this country, where they start pushing back and diminishing workers' efforts and trying to squash workers' efforts, like our, our uh, president has, has been trying to do with every game that we've made in this country today. So basically, in a nutshell, that is what May Day is about. Now, what is May Day in Seattle? And May Day in Seattle actually started to be celebrated in large numbers. There were always, you know, flashpoints of, you know, socialist group over here or a communist party group over there. And they'd get their friends together and do a little march and, you know, 10, 20 people. You know, but it wasn't until the, after the 2000, after the WTO, that a comité took it upon itself to declare the um, May Day, or May 1st, as a worker, immigrant rights worker struggle. And it was, you know, it kind of fell in line with what, what the brothers and sisters that were in Chicago, the martyrs in Chicago, the people who were eventually hanged for whatever bullshit Trump up charges they put up against them, um, and, and what the immigrant workers were facing in this country. And that's the inability to organize in their work, workplaces, the inability to be um, safe in their homes without being having to be separated and deported. Uh, and so it was uh, after the WTO that that Comité got, you know, joined up together, folks from different organizations got came together and developed the Comité, and they held their first march. Uh, I believe the first march was up in Holly, uh, Holy Name Church, and ever since, until 2006, and you know, they used to have demonstrations. Oh, I'm sorry, the first one was here out of Seattle Central Community College. You're right. It's out of here, Seattle Central, and down to downtown Seattle. But you know, it was an, and they would have like 200, 300 people, 400 people marching every year. And in 2006, during the Sensenbrenner um, administration, uh, during, it was, a, it was a, during the Sensenbrenner bill was introduced in 2006 that people really came out. And the reason was is that Sensenbrenner, who was a senator, was trying to propose a bill that would criminalize, much like what they're doing in France right now, trying to criminalize everybody that gave any assistance to undocumented uh, workers or to immigrants that are not legally in this country or supposed to be. So folks just kind of, what the hell's going on here? You know, the, and most of the folks that that revolted at that time or who were really concerned about it were people in the social services community, the teachers, the uh, priests and the nuns and people in the religious community because, you know, most of the way we do a lot of our, our solidarity work in this country is through uh, charity. You know, that's how we express our solidarity and support for other workers is by giving them charity. And so, this really put their lives in jeopardy, their livelihood, and their freedoms in jeopardy. And so people said, Charlie, we're not going to do that. Fortunately, we already always had a May 1st march. But what folks in the Latino community did was that we organized on April 10th, 2006, a pre-march, just kind of test the waters. And throughout the country and here in the city of Seattle, we had 
Here in the city, we had about 40,000 people come out to a march, which was fairly big considering that the largest march before that had been the WTO with 50,000 people. And so we were, wow, this is something else. It's not like we were any great organizers or anything. People were pissed, you know? <laughs> I like that. I like when people get pissed, you know? Because they come out. They're concerned about what the hell's going on in their country. They're concerned about their situation. They're concerned about their fellow workers. And that's real solidarity, not charity. So what what ended up happening is that on, you know, as as a just an observation of the May first and of the April tenth, which is Emiliano Zapata's birthday. Emiliano Zapata is a revolutionary from Mexico that uh, fought in the during the Mexican Revolution and. So that happened, and we said, okay, well, let's try May 1st. So we did. And so we basically developed a vessel for people to participate in. You know, that's what we did in the, the march. And here in Seattle, the police, not us, reported that there were 80,000 people that, showed, that came out in the streets of Seattle. One of the largest marches in the city ever. And from our perspective, it was a general strike. Throughout the country, the fields were empty, the factories were empty, the hotels were empty, the workers were not working. And so everything where immigrants worked and the construction sites, the um, warehouses, everywhere where you saw a lot of immigrants was dead. And so it, was, it really freaked out the bourgeoisie of this country. It freaked out the ruling class. Because they, for those two days, they lost vast amounts of money because nobody worked. And it's only through making you guys work that they get money. You know? And so that kind of situation uh, really back, make, we made the government back off. We made Sensenbrenner pull back his legislation. We made the rest of the uh, administration pull back on their con continuous attacks on the immigrant But they reorganize themselves, and you know we keep organizing and we keep demonstrating, and now we're at where we're at. And so we really, really need you guys to get your butts out there on May 1st, really, and show your solidarity for workers, not charity. We don't need your charity. We need your solidarity. You know, and it's one day, so don't go out in the pole and run around the pole that kind of stuff. Come on out, <laughs> join us. That's it. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, you know, this panel is, the theme to this panel is why we march. And I didn't really start asking myself why I did march until yesterday. And I was talking to my friend from Venezuela. And I don't know if y'all know what's happening in Venezuela, but it's, it's really bad down there. It's really bad right down there. And we just started talking, I started asking her, like, is there any talk about revolution down in Venezuela? And she said, there was a couple of protests, but they keep getting shot down by the police officers of the government. And then I, 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 we kept talking about this. And then she told me there's this one group of protesters that were chased down into a poison lake. And they had either had a choice to get shot down or like swim in this poison lake and get sick. So then I started asking myself again, like, why do I protest? And it's just because I still can protest. I still have a voice out here. And you know, like May Day, like, um, May Day this year is going to be about ICE. And it's just not fair that those people that do leave those countries that are like not doing so good and come over here. It's not fair for that they're being terrorized and um, yeah, just being scared to just leave their house. It's not fair. And so something like I'm not gonna stand for it because I personally have family that is scared to like walk out of their house right now in Utah um, because of ICE. And it's not fair, you know. Like this country, if you know the history, you know Native Americans and like especially like like Mexican. <laughs> Uh, indigenous groups used to like roam, like be this, this is their country. Um, yeah, and also Seattle Central has a huge history. Like Seattle Central was the starting point or even the ending point of like a lot of demonstrations here in Seattle. Um, yeah, you know, protest just gives voice to marginalized communities. Yeah, <laughs> that's all I have to say. <laughs> but I was brought along in the May 1st March when I was around, I don't really remember, but I was in elementary school. 
So right in 2006 and all that was going on, my dad had to explain to me what was going on and it just sounded really fucked up and I was like, this is not okay. And even my little mind was like, this is terrorizing. Like, why would someone get in trouble for helping me? Why would my teachers get in trouble for teaching me? Like, that's not okay. So then, you know, we all agreed that we were going to go and we ended up going to these marches and from there on we started to get involved. Um, and then from there on, like it wasn't really just, we were forced to, you know, to do this because if not then bad things were going to happen to us and bad things were going to happen to my family. From there on, um, and around around that same time, a little, like a year later, I don't remember the exact year, I don't know if Randy or Gokan I can, can remind me, but um, this, the city we were living in, so if you know where Auburn's at, there's another little city next to it, it's called Pacific. It's tiny, people would usually pass it and don't know it's another city, they just think it's part of Auburn. But um, my parents had bought the for their first house there, and for their luck, the police were acting like ICE immigration. So they are basically um, asking brown folks like if they had their papers, or if they had their citizenship, and if you didn't know how to answer correctly, or if you stayed quiet, they just automatically detained you, and then drove you to the detention center in Tacoma. So then, um, from there on, um, we, our family did not feel comfortable anymore, but we knew something had to get done. And we felt terrorized by the police and the city council and the mayor. I remember like, we, like if we would see a cop, like they used to park outside our house and like, you know, watch us from the street, so then we'd have to lock the doors. And like being scared from the police at such a young age is not okay. So then from there, I, I realized that if you don't do something about it, then you're just going to feel scared all the time. And that was not a good feeling. So then um, I started to join my parents like, in protest and meetings, even though I didn't really understand everything that was going on. Like I would hear their conversations. And I, now that I'm getting older, I start to understand why things were done the way they were done. And why our community always has to go first before all these politicians, and why we always have to go back and listen to the community, and why this maybe like they can't go to every meeting, but they'll show up to May first. And then um, now that I'm getting older, I'm and I'm actually organizing where I work to get families to go out in March this year, and they're excited, they're scared as well, because you know last year. You know, I don't remember how West Lake Center got. Um, it was, was scary, and and then that's why I marched because I, I just know that it's very empowering, especially for folks who it's like the first time organizing, the first time seeing some kind of action, seeing other folks in solidarity, seeing people from different different um, from around the world, even different ethnicities. They like hearing the kids like, oh yeah, they showed up for us. They sh they're they're actually there for us. You know, they're showing up for my family, like, they're white and they understand, they're Asian and they, they understand that we're all in the same struggle, the same working class struggle. So that's why I feel like it's important, especially important for youth to show up and, you know, see that people really do want them in this country, really, really do care about them, that it's not just charity work, that it, it is solidarity, and that they'll show up for them. Or at least that's why I'm marked.
for even, you know, being here in the first place. And, you know, the least we could do is continue on the work they're doing as you know, they get older. And now that I'm working with other youth, I feel a lot of the times um, uh, people don't realize just how powerful we are. But when it comes to um, really seeing how many people gather out that day uh, on May 1st, it really just shows how powerful our community really is. And also coming from a little bit of a different perspective of being um, indigenous to Mexico and being Urepecha and not identifying as Latino or Latina, um, it, should, it just shows that um, the issue also affects all sorts of types of people. Like once when I was talking to a family friend, we talked about how um, it almost seems like a web of how we're all connected and how if there was like a piece like linking, it would kind of create a domino effect of all the people it would affect if one of us were to uh, be deported and taken back. And also another, a lot of the times people don't realize, um, they often say that, you know, we're in the shadows and it's time to come out, but referring to the undocumented or immigrant community, which I think it's kind of like, kind of like, uh, not the best uh, analogy to make, because I feel we're very, we're a very vibrant community, and you know, we've always been there, like, we've gone to school with you guys, or, um, we shopped at the same grocery stores, we were in the same soccer teams, we've been around you this entire time. It's just our documentation status didn't really define us. And so I march for my family and I march for my sister and I march for all the other youth that are being affected. Because uh, Mirna added to it this earlier about the fact that the reason we're marching this year is not for immigration reform. I mean, we know that with this bullshit president we got, you know, there is no possibility of immigration reform. But we want them to tie up their dogs. We want their dogs to be put in kennels, or we want them removed from Washington State. And that's the Immigration Customs and Enforcement Agents. There are over, ICE is the largest domestic army that the federal government has. Over 250,000 of them throughout the country. That's not counting the border patrol. This is just, you know, this ICE agent. And the ICE was created right after 9-11. And their sole purpose for being created was to look out for terrorists. They do not serve any other purpose. And so we want them out of our community. We pay for those idiots to be out there with their guns and try arresting people and separating families and creating havoc. You know, it's like having over 250,000 IRS agents looking for you because you didn't pay your taxes. That's, a, that's the same thing that this, the guys are supposed to do. When the police went, um, when the police were arresting people in Pacific, they were they were arresting them. With, they had no right. They don't have any responsibility under the law. They're not ICE agents. They're not trained. We've been fighting for sanctuary city in the city and the county, and now the state, because the police officers and the state officials have no responsibility toward the federal government unless it's a criminal activity. Unless it's a criminal activity. But other than that, they don't, they don't actually don't have any responsibility. They're not trained as, as ICE agents. They don't know federal law. I mean, they barely know local laws. You know, they barely know, I mean, they shoot people all the time, but they don't even know their own names sometimes. You know? And so it's, it's really important for us to put a muzzle on these animals. You know? And we want to let everybody know, everybody, that we will continue this as long as we can to assure that ICE services in the state of Washington are removed. The Trump administration threatened to take it out of, out of California, and we wrote back to them and said, please do it in the state of Washington, too. You know, while you're at it. And I'm pretty sure Oregon would love the same kind of treatment. Save us a lot of money. 
we have enough police forces in this country and a lot enough Gestapo's in this country that we don't need, you know, 250,000, 300,000 agents running around, you know, trying to spy on people um, and, and arresting people. There is no reason. This is a civil matter. Immigration is a civil matter. It's not a criminal matter. Unfortunately, Clinton created it as a, as a criminal matter when he when he created the anti-terror law when he was the, the president of the United States. So, you know, the, the situation in, for us here is that we need your help because you guys pay for this service. You guys need the service. How many of you guys really use that service? Or would, you know, I mean, we have, we don't, it's not that we don't appreciate being protected, but they don't protect anybody. They only protect their own mamas. Yeah. But we, we need to get these guys out of uniforms and into jobs where they're doing construction, building bridges, or, you know, creating uh, sewer lines. I don't know, whatever that, whatever that needs to be done in our society. But we don't need more police. We don't need more Gestapo's. We don't need this fascist. You know, uh, separating our families. And I know because my family was divided in the 1930s, where over a million and a half Mexicanos were deported under, under a so-called um, voluntary deportation. Half of my family was born here and half of my family was born in Mexico. And it was the kind of the same conditions, trying to put the blame on other folks when they created the problem when they created that kind of issue. Right now, for example, in Mexico, over 200,000 people have been murdered. 200,000 people. If that had happened anywhere here, you know, we'd have a crisis. Over 30,000 people have been disappeared. That government is corrupt. The people in Mexico need to take care of it, and they will. But by the same token, we've created that problem. Your taxes have created that problem. Your businesses have created that problem. We have two uh, people that are coming to the May Day First March. One of them is uh, Diana, and the other one is a guy by the name of Leon Fierro, Diana Arangure. And they both are working in an organization in Mexicali called Mexicali Resiste. And Mexicali Resiste has been fighting a beer company called Constellation Brands. Constellation Brands creates Corona, Bohemia, um, Budweiser, all these beers for exportation. They, they, they make them in, in Mexicali and they export them. Over 95% of the beers that are made there are exported to the United States. And May 5th comes where they, you know, they call it Drinco de Mayo now, instead of Cinco de Mayo. And they, they export it, but you know what they're doing? They're stealing the people's water. They created a desalination plant in, in, uh, in Baja California. And the water, that desalination water is being given to the public. But the potable water that's coming down the Colorado River, which is by all, by all rights, the, the, the property of the people of Baja California is being diverted into companies such as Constellation Brands to make beer. And they are, the, and so there's a lot of the population, a lot of the towns that are not getting beer. That they don't want, and this is a boycott. The, the folks in Baja California are calling it a boycott, but it's not your typical boycott. It's not your typical boycott because they're not asking for any worker re redemption. Because that's what a boycott does: is say, you know, treat the workers right, blah blah blah, all that bullshit. No, what they're saying, the boycott is to get that damn company out of Baja California, out. Back into the United States, you want to you want to steal your water, steal it over here. Then they have to deal with us. But because they they're in cahoots with that corrupt government in Baja California, they've got the people by the tail, and we gotta help them. Stop drinking Corona, stop drinking Bohemia, stop drinking those brands. And if you look on um, on the internet, look for Facebook. Mexicali Resiste, and you'll have a list of all the beers. Don't drink them. We got a lot of breweries here, a lot of small breweries. Use those if you want to get drunk. And then if you want to really get high, get some smoke, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, <laughs> folks. Don't drink, Don't drink Corona, please. But that's what, that's what this May 1st means to us here in Seattle. It means stop ice, get rid of ice, 
get rid of the of, uh, the constellation brands in Baja California because we're showing real solidarity with the people in Baja California. We're supporting them, we're helping them with this boycott, and we want to make sure that they win in Baja California. Um, could you talk a little about the, the May 1st protest, you know, where you guys are starting, what time, you know, people... Oh, sure. Here we go. <laughs> Here's the flyers. Um, 19th Annual May, May Day March, Immigrant Workers' Rights start. We start gathering at 2.30 at Judkins Park, and we hit the streets at 3.30. We'll march down Jackson Street, down to Second. And then we're taking second, which is a one-way coming this way. We're taking second all the way to spring in front of what, uh, what we consider are the uh, headquarters of ICE. You know, I mean, this is the interesting thing about ICE, is that they, they won't tell you where their headquarters are at. They're so scared of us. You know, they keep putting that they're in, uh, at the airport, you know, that bumper ship they got over there. And that they've got offices up here on on fourth and fifth and on second. You know, you know, you never know who they are. Have you, how many guys have read The Stranger lately? I mean, about three three weeks ago. Did you, the one where they where they have the idiot that they brought in from Florida. They have this fascist pig that they brought in to head the deportation program for for ICE here locally. And uh, Dan Savage is the one that wrote the article. And they put it on the front page with, uh, you know, the thought of this guy kind of thing. Mm -hmm. you, got, you saw that, right? You guys read it? It was three pages, man. I've never seen a stranger dedicate that much time to immigration, which was good. But if you do get a chance, Google it, pull it out, read it. It's really important, Dan Savage, as much as I think he's very liberal, uh, did a good job on this. You know, he really focused on, on what, what he wanted to expose in that. And that was the work of ICE, and that is the, this fascist pig that they brought in to uh, corral people in this area. Any questions? Come on, I know you guys have questions. I was reading also in the Stranger that uh, both Seattle City Lights and the Washington Department of Transportation have given um, information to ICE. You know, even though they were not, um, you know, legally obligated in a way. Um, can you talk a little about that? And you know, um, like, what are some? How did that could happen? Like, you know, there could be no repercussions against these organizations. Okay. We've been telling Jay Inslee, and we've been telling the state legislature and the Senate that they need to pass a sanctuary state, like similar to the one that they did in California. And they've been, oh no, we don't need it here, we got, you know, the state patrol doesn't ask questions, nobody asks questions, no, but that's not the shit, you know. What we're talking about here is cooperation between the federal government and the state government. And what happened was the Department of Licensing was sharing information on people's residency in this country. And, and Jay didn't know about it, supposedly. Uh, but when we, when people confronted, we didn't. Uh, when we found out about it, we said, yeah, I'm sure, you know. But there were some organizations, such as Asian Council and Referral Services at Centro and a whole bunch of other, for One America, they, they got that little group in together and we you know, wrote a letter to the mayor and um, the, to the governor and asking for him to remove the director to date the director's there, still there, because that cooperation lasted over a long period of time. The same thing happened in City Light, you're very, very uh, right, the, the Department of uh, Immigration was asking City Light for information specifically about certain individuals. Now, every state, uh, like Oregon and California, they require that if you want to have information, you need to have a warrant. Everybody. I mean, I think that's that's the logical thing, right? If you want information on, on, on you as a student here, and the administration just willy-nilly gives the information out, wouldn't you be pissed? Yeah. I mean, 
you're not, you don't have any criminal record. You've never had any real problem with the law, but these guys are out there fishing. And so they're, they're asking for information just based on their last name or based on ethnicity or based on religion or whatever they decide they want to focus on. And so that, that is a real big breach of trust by Jake. And he needs to take care of this shit. He needs to get rid of that director. And we, you know, we've already uh, told him that this is going to be part of our demonstration today. And the mayor, I don't know what they're doing. We want to meet with the city and try to figure out what they can do because that's not going, that's not flying very well. The whole city light thing about giving people information. Supposedly it stopped and now they're requiring warrants and stuff like that both the governor and the city. But unless they have a law, anybody can do whatever the hell they want. You're a worker, right? And somebody contacts you and says, hey, Joe, can you give me this information? Oh, yeah, sure. But if there's a law that says you cannot do that, you run the risk of losing your job. Yeah. And so that's, that's what makes sanctuary uh, city law here in the city of Seattle important for us or the one we passed in the county, important for us, to hold back you know, people that are, think they're doing a patriotic duty for their country. That's basically what it comes down to. I, mean, I, you know, I can see some people feeling, well, this is my patriotic duty. I have a two-part question. Um, first part is, uh, was it a Florida Pacific? The city that you guys are speaking of, Dallas, by Auburn. Okay, and two, as a part of the community, um, what is the best way for us to take action other than make a march year round? And that's just like keeping up to date. Uh, uh, well, it was. Oh, I got my Pacific, they're considered technically two yeah. yeah. But like, even though they're both small, and they both should just combine, but it's, yeah, Pacific is uh, right next to it. Yeah, they're right really close to each other. And also the, the way that they pay their police is by um, tickets and traffic stops. So be careful when you're in Pacific. <laughs> the speed limit changes exactly right between Auburn and Pacific. It goes from like 40 down to like 20. It's like very drastically cut up right there. Yeah. And well, what, what we have been doing, like as Youth United year round, is the the way we get organized is we talk about we talk about it in discussion in a group. Like we kind of, how we well, first how we got connected with you that actually wanted to continue working year round is slowly but surely we we, we talked amongst like one another, and we got it was kind of like by word how we all got invited and created this group. And from there, we kind of make decisions based on discussions we have and then votes on what we think we should do next. But also, another important key is we like to hear a lot of feedback from our community. So we're actually hold, holding a community assembly on Saturday to kind of give back to the community what we are doing and what they want us to do next. And so um, the past year, we were able to, um, we were able to, yeah, yeah, and that's what I'm saying. Like, like for like for example, we did organizing in our school district, so it can help better uh, undocumented and immigrant students in the school. But we also worked in the city level um, on what we can do more to protect um, immigrant and undocumented. So, so I feel like the best way to continue doing work is looking around locally and looking um, what needs to be done or what could be done to be showing up showing up when it's needed at certain times that they just need support and they need to show that people care. Like when it came to the city hall meetings, we needed people to show up and then we were like, we would pack up the, the city hall room and then as soon as the topic that we came for was done, it was like empty again, crickets. So it's like showing up when, when, um, when it's needed, city hall meetings, um, asking what you can volunteer in, what needs to be done, because I think a lot of the times it falls a lot on us and we have, there's a lot to get done and there's certain things that other folks can be helping like maybe the May 1st March doing security or helping out with certain other things, volunteering, your time, voting. Yes. Aren't you guys also sending some of your uh, partners to training? Oh yeah, and if you want to help youth <laughs> and you want to keep their growing and, and help them grow and develop, 
this summer, uh, I guess a lot of folks that are doing a lot of work around the DREAM Act and different um, groups and um, campaigns, they all went to this leadership camp, including myself. It's called La Cima. I don't know if you have heard about it. It's La Cima Leadership Camp. They send, uh, it's every year, and then this year, my sister was able to go as well, but this year we want to send our our folks um, down to um, five of them, and then they're asking for, a, since the school only gave one of them um, a scholarship, but we have to bring up the rest of the money. So right now we're asking for support on um, folks who can just donate five books. It helps out um, when you get $1,000 by Monday to send everybody and we also need to provide transportation. But this will help the youth, um, at least when I went to the camp, it really helped me get out of my comfort zone and make sure that I was more comfortable presenting and speaking about my story and letting folks know um, what we're doing. So then this would, this money is gonna go towards the youth to um, send them for a week of camp to pay for their meals and their, their, um, their camp. Stay there. Yeah, we were talking in a group. We talked about how uh, one, it's only going to help us become even stronger leaders, and two, it would help us connect with other youth in Washington State that could also, um, you know, come and we can encourage them to do similar work that we're doing as well. And then also just to clarify that they're not just asking for money. When they realized that they needed to raise that money, instead of asking their parents for money, they went to go ask them to buy them fruit. And these past two days, they've been selling fruit cups at school. So they made like you know, once they sell at the Mexican store, with, like chamoy and everything. Like they've been selling them at school, and they've been raising their own money. But it's not going to be enough, and they're going to be selling at the community assembly in Auburn as well um, this Saturday. So um, if you want to look them up, it's called at Auburn Youth United. So that's on Facebook, at Auburn Youth United. And you can go ahead, and uh, the link is there. So it's, it's just supporting our work so that we keep uh, growing and learning. And you can also uh, look at our Facebook on May 1st coalition and then. You know, we try to keep people up to date on, what, on the kind of struggles that are going on and uh, the different kinds of activities that are going that we're trying to launch. Uh, we have, we're, we're gonna have a, a year long campaign to, to raise more and more, I wouldn't say consciousness, I'd say health. Uh, about ice in this, in this area. So we want, uh, if you want to volunteer some time, if you want to you know, contribute, if you want to uh, give your opinion, we, we're holding community forums in, in the area and we'll notify you through Facebook. And also I think another way you can help is really listening to our documented folks and hearing them out on what are their needs or what are they asking for. Um, there are a lot of nonprofits who claim to be doing certain work, but really don't um, don't ask them what they want. They just assume that that's what we want. So a lot of times, just being very careful on who you go help, or if that person really does have that connection with a non-documented community. I think that would be my part, and just yeah, making sure that you hear them out. Because a lot of the times, people are like, "Oh, this is what you want," and I'm like, well, "Maybe that's not what I want." Maybe I wanted something for my family. Maybe I wanted this, but you know, and really, that's why the community assemblies are so important because that way we're all kind of on the same page, and you're like, oh, well, we kind of want this and this, and well, that sounds more like this, and then that's like just showing up and hearing them out, I guess, giving them the time to speak. Voting, like make sure, making sure like the right person gets up and have a vote. Mm -hmm. Just on that note, there's um, a group over there in the hallway that's registering voters. If you're not registered, go register. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, be a little bit more critical about who you vote for. Because there are Democrats being mm -hmm. um, Or, you know, of course, the Republicans are. But there's other alternatives. There's socialist parties and there's different other groups that are vying for, for entry into that crazy world called electoral process. And, uh, you know, some of them folks could use your help. And, and before we end, I just want to let you know the other work that Youth United is doing at the moment. They're trying to get ethnic studies 
out in um, Dunn in our school district. So if y'all want to keep updated with that and support us, like our page on Facebook. Um, if, uh, right now, we want it to be mandatory, but as what it's looking like, we'll probably just leave it as an elective. So if you are interested in supporting our work or sending us any information on it, um, that's what we're working on this year. I would be, uh, in this budget, ask for volunteers for the work for smart meetings, these teachers. Uh, so if you uh, want to volunteer, if you want to raise your hand right now, let me know, I'll put your name down and then I'll put you down. So that we can be happy with you. We really need some help in this Please join me in thanking our presenters. of our panelists one-on-one. -on -one. If they are willing to do that, please first ask them if they have time to talk to you, and then ask. And if they say yes, then go ahead and engage in that discussion. I'll take your surveys as you walk out. Thank you so much for being here. Hope to see you in the future. Yeah, um, for those of you that 